Hey, welcome back to chapter four, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about aldehydes and ketones today, and we're going to identify, name, and draw these molecules that form these functional groups. We're going to recognize and predict products for the reactions that form aldehydes and ketones. So to start us off, let's talk about just kind of three basic things, uh, important facts about aldehydes and ketones, first of all. Um, both of these functional groups are together in one video because they're both um, part of a larger group called carbonyls, which means they both contain a double bonded oxygen somewhere along the carbon chain. For aldehydes, the general formula looks like uh, like this. Notice the double bonded oxygen, that's what makes it a carbonyl. On one side you have a carbon chain, on the other side you simply have a hydrogen. Ketones are very similar, double bonded oxygen on a carbon, except here there's carbons on both sides of the double bonded oxygen. Um, what you'll really notice about the difference between aldehydes and ketones is aldehydes have the double bonded oxygen on the end of a chain, that's why there's just a hydrogen here, where ketones have the double bonded oxygen on the middle of a chain, so there's carbon groups on both opposite sides. All right, so let's go over naming some aldehydes. The first thing we want to do is find the longest chain and name the parent chain with the suffix al. So we have a six carbon chain here. We have an aldehyde, so and there's no double bond, so we're going to name it hexanal. We got a number starting at the aldehyde. A number is not needed to indicate position of the double bonded O since it's on the end, and it's always on the end because it's an aldehyde. Lastly, we need to name any attached groups and arrange the name as always. So we have a chloro coming off of the fourth carbon and a methyl off of the fifth. So alphabetical order, four chloro, five methyl, hexanal. Here's a slightly more complicated example. We're going to name the molecule at the bottom right. First thing is always to find the longest chain that contains the aldehyde. It's pretty easily found here. Now there's six carbons in that chain that makes it a hex um, with al at the end. The difference here is it's not hex and al, it's hexene al. Obviously that's because we have a double bond all along the chain. So just like you would have always called this a hexene, um, now it's just a hexene al. The other difference here is we do have a number in front of this backbone. You have to note that the number applies to the position of the double bond, not the aldehyde. You never have to put a number f to say where the aldehyde is located. Last thing, of course, is to name any attached group. There's a methyl on, on carbon 5, so the final name being 5-methyl 4-hexene al. All right, let's get into some special benzene names with the aldehyde. So if an aldehyde is attached to a benzene, the name is benzaldehyde. Uh, one thing you have to realize is that there's always going to be this carbon here coming off of the benzene ring. We kind of just ignore it and just consider it to be part of the aldehyde because otherwise there would never be an aldehyde off of a benzene ring because there would be too many bonds there. So the carbon is just named in the aldehyde name. We're going to start numbering uh, the benzene at the aldehyde. A number is not needed in the name because it, it's a high functional group and it will always be coming off of the first carbon, kind of like our phenol with our alcohol that comes off of a benzene or CH3 group for toluene. If di substituted, remember to use OM and P designations. If tri substituted or greater, give the lowest numbers possible. So this one is O methyl benzaldehyde. Okay, now let's move on and uh, deal with some ketones. Notice the difference again between aldehydes and ketones. Here you have the same double bonded O, but since it's on a middle carbon, not the end one or this end one, that technically makes it a ketone, so it has its own separate naming rules. Rule one, find the longest chain with the ketone attached and name the parent chain with the suffix own. So here is the longest chain with the ketone. There's seven carbons, so that makes it a heptanone. You want to number this chain starting at the end closest to the ketone on this molecule. That's the right-hand side. Um, and because a ketone could be on any of these middle carbons, you do have to include a number to indicate the position of the double-bonded oxygen. So this isn't just heptanone. It's three heptanone. Lastly, deal with any attached groups. Arrange them alphabetically just like always. There is a methyl on carbon number two. So the final name would be two methyl, three heptanone. 
All right, we're going to name a slightly more complex ketone. In this case, we have two ketones. We have one coming off the fourth and one coming off the second, and there's seven carbons in that chain. So we have a heptan dione. The dye shows you that there's two ketones coming off of that. Our numbers out front, two and four, shows you the position of the ketone. And then we have a 6-methyl because that's the only other substituent coming off of the uh, chain here. So we have 6-methyl, 2,4-heptan-dione. And lastly, you can have ketones on uh, cyclic alkanes, actually. Um, as a side note, before we name this, if you think about it, if you ever have a double-bonded oxygen on a cyclic ring like this, it has to be a ketone since there's no end to the chain. Uh, it will never be an aldehyde. So if you ever see this, you're always going to name it as a ketone automatically. Uh, the backbone is the cyclic ring. It's six carbons long, so it's a cyclohexane. Um, and since there's a ketone on it, we simply call it cyclohexanone. You would have to number, um, but not for the ketone. The ketone has to be number one, so you don't need to say that. But you have to include the numbering for that methyl group attached, final name being 2-methyl cyclohexanone. All right, let's take a look at some aldehyde and ketone reactions. The first one is an oxidation of an aldehyde. If an aldehyde reacts with an oxidizing agent that's a compound with oxygen in it, a hydroxyl group is added onto the aldehyde carbon. So if we take a look down here, we have our aldehyde. We're adding an oxidi oxidizing agent. And all that's going to happen is this uh, alcohol is going to be ended or extended off of that last carbon. Later on, uh, we will go over a functional group called a carboxylic acid. Uh, that is what's actually being formed here. Uh, this group here is called a carboxylic acid. Ketones cannot be oxidized since they are in the middle of the chain. That's something to keep in mind. So this oxidation is only going to take place with aldehydes. Our second reaction is called uh, reduction. This reaction can happen with aldehydes or ketones. You'll see why uh, when we get there. Uh, the way it works is you take an aldehyde or ketone molecule and you react it with hydrogen gas, like you see in the example below. Here's your ketone, plus H2. Um, this has to take place with a catalyst. Platinum works as a pretty good catalyst for this reaction. Um, the reaction itself is, is very simple. You simply take the carbonyl and turn that carbonyl into a hydroxyl or an alcohol. Technically what happens is the H2 splits apart, one of the hydrogen atoms attaches to this oxygen, which causes the double bond to break and become a single bond. You can see the single bond here. Uh, the second hydrogen from the H2 actually attaches down to this carbon right here, because that carbon would need four bonds after this double bond breaks, um, and it gives you this alcohol as a product. So when you see these, all you have to do is turn the aldehyde or the ketone into an alcohol. Our third reaction is an oxidation of alcohols into aldehydes or ketones, just depending where that alcohol starts at. This is the reverse of the previous reduction reaction. What's going to happen here is we're going to add an oxidizing reagent to this alcohol. And both of the H's are going to go with the oxygen in this oxi oxidizing agent. And the uh, energy here is going to fold over. So this bond between the OH is going to fold over to make this double bond. So an alcohol is converted back into the aldehyde or ketone. What's going to determine whether it's an aldehyde or a ketone is where the alcohol is present at the start. If it's on an end carbon, it will be an aldehyde. In this case, it's on a middle carbon, so it's going to be a ketone. And lastly, just some common uses for aldehydes and ketones, so you can see where these things might occur in, uh, or be useful in real life. Most of you probably have heard of formaldehyde, if you think back to your biology days. Formaldehyde, uh, which you would better know now as methanol, you can dissolve in water to make a solution that preserves dead organic matter and keeps it from decomposing. So in your biology class, you probably had a bunch of containers uh, with animals inside of them that were not decaying. That was due to the formaldehyde dissolved in the water. Also. Um, acetone, most people recognize as nail polish remover. Uh, we would now call this officially by the name propanone. Uh, this is a really good solvent, so it works great to remove nail polish from nails. So in today's objectives, we did accomplish both of them. We identified, named, and 
also drill out a couple of the molecules that contain aldehyde and ketone functional groups. Uh, just remember that the endings for an aldehyde are AL. The ending for a ketone is ONE. And uh, we recognized and predicted some products of some reactions. We went over three reactions. Uh, we're either oxidizing them or reducing them. If you have any questions, please bring them to next class.